I got, uh, I think Bob has some explaining to do. I'm going to, I'm going to pound Four. him. I'm going to pound him. <laughs> yeah, well, take him to task. Yeah. Christians are going to love me after this. I'm going to say, Doug, he's our man. He's our easiest <laughs> friend. You know, Dr. Price is quite knowledgeable. This might backfire. You think Dr. Price knows more than me? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> you you have um a master's, is that right? I have two master's degrees. Oh, you have two master's degrees. Wow. Yeah. My I have I have three degrees, my wife has three degrees. They call us Mr. and Mrs. Fahrenheit. <laughs> uh, hey brother John good. hey Beach. if you're a Christian and you're new here uh, welcome Rob Price should be here shortly but um, things happen so I guess that we can show our faces now I'm dressed okay this is this is going to be a new setup I don't need that one yet. How's that look? How's the audio, guys? See all those books behind me? I have not read one of them. <laughs> uh, maybe because they're not real. <laughs> Real if you believe hard enough. Hey, this could be him. Let's see. Robert, welcome. Hey, how you doing? I'm doing well, thank you. My name's Doug. So, okay, uh, good. To, you must be the famous Pine Creek Doug. Yes, uh, not or to be the... not to be confused with my twin brother, Pine River. Uh huh. Uh huh. <laughs> this gentleman. How you uh, doing, Bob? This guy here, his name's Cam, hey. and he um, he's a good friend of mine. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering, are we having a little bit of a delay here? Uh, say something. Um, I uh, four score and seven years ago, H.P. Lovecraft brought forth on this continent. It's good. Uh, oddly angled. Okay. <laughs> It's it's a it's a tiny delay. I but see what you mean, though. Yeah, it's not too I bad. I think that I might be a bit um, delayed. But we're gonna we're gonna try to to go through this, even if there is a slight delay. But um, so, mm. do you want me to call you Doctor Price, Bob, Robert? Uh, Bob is fine. Bob, okay. Um, yeah, I hate pretension. So I, I guess um, we should introduce you because some people uh, we have right now 33 people and my guess is that will double over the course of the period of the live stream people watching. Um, feel free to to say anything about yourself uh, that you think people should know. If you want to plug something now in the beginning, you can. And then at the end, I'll also give you an opportunity to do that. Or if you're a really humble guy, uh, I can get Cam to brag about you for 60 seconds. <laughs> I'd like uh, that. Flip a coin here. Uh, well, I could just say I um, have dual interests. Uh, I'm uh, very interested in religion, theology, the history of religions, the Bible. And uh, I, I entered that through being a teenage fundamentalist, just like in the old movie. I was a teenage fundamentalist, uh, but uh, I uh, fought my way out of it. Ironically, it was the the uh, heightened interest and dedication in getting straight what the Bible meant, which was important for one reason when I was a believer that led me out of belief uh, because it made more sense uh, on the assumptions of uh, rigorous criticism. And um, I, I feel like I understand it much better. And I, I guess I'd say I love the Bible more than ever. Uh, it's just uh, I, I no longer have real religious beliefs and don't miss them. 
Uh, then on the other hand, I'm uh, big into H.P. Uh, Lovecraft, Robert E. Howard, Edgar Rice Burroughs, uh, various uh, comic book superheroes and things like that. And I've I've edited oh, uh, something like 40 anthologies of uh, fiction like that. I write um, weird fiction short stories and um my wife Carol re refers to it as my uh, Jekyll side and my Hyde side, but uh, actually I think there's a lot of continuity because it's very clear to me that uh, modern superheroes are a, a seamless continuation of ancient mythology and the same archetypes rule both and uh, they both religious myth and um, secular fantasy are ways of uh, broadening the horizon of one's imagination. And uh, so I really don't see them opposed to one another. I have to uh, apologize to you for something, Bob. Um, I used to be a fundamental Christian as well, fundamentalist. And I, um, I used to not like you very much. Huh. And I thought, you know, everybody like you and uh, were just crazy and... Um, hated God and wanted to just make people like me lose my faith and uh, maybe even lead me to hell. And, um, but you know what, after several years of trying to view myself in the third person, I, uh, I can say now this is like 10, 15 years ago, but now I, I tell you, I respect you. Um, and I don't think you're uh, bad guy. So if there's any Christians watching, you're not a, out there to hurt anybody or or lead them to hell or anything like that. You're, you're just, I, I like how you you often say it, you call it as you see it. And that's what you're doing. And you're doing the, the best uh, you can to interpret uh, the scriptures and the, and the um, gospels and so forth. So yeah, I, I apologize to you for even thinking that a long time ago, even though I didn't directly hurt you. But but that's where I'm you from. would inevitably think that I, I completely understand and used to feel the same way. Uh, and I, I always like to point out on the Bible geek that I have no interest in changing anybody's beliefs. It, it's simply none of my business what anybody believes. And uh, it certainly doesn't get away in the way of friendship. I have good friends, uh, some of my best friends who are still evangelical Christians, and I don't uh, try to get them not to be. And uh, I, I don't hate God. Uh, I don't. Uh, my my uh, non theism is a kind of a respectful dissent uh, because I I got a degree in theology. I, I still am sort of loyal to it. I love theology. I love reading theologians. They're real problems. I don't take Richard Dawkins' view that it's just a lot of malarkey. Uh, and uh, it's like uh, studying the history of philosophy. There are many systems of thought that you don't happen to find uh, uh, persuasive, but it's nonetheless fascinating to try to understand them. And um, I, I feel like uh, it's, I, I have, I kind of think this is pantheism, theism, etc. It's a whole range. And I find myself for the last several years as a non-theist, but I have great respect and love for the Christian tradition and really all religious traditions. So I, I like to be in dialogue. I only get into debates when uh, that uh, some some apologist is selling the audience a bill of goods, uh, that there's some kind of chicanery going on, and I just feel it's my responsibility uh, being a New Testament scholar to try to set the record straight. But then again, I own theories as dogmas. I, I'm just trying to be Socratic and supply people with uh, new perspectives and new data they may not have considered and what they do with it, you know, uh, more power to you, whatever. It's not a well, my affair. This is a good segue because well, you said you want to set the record straight uh, when you hear some apologists talk. Um, can we try something? Can I, even though I'm, I'm, a, I'm like you, I'm not a theist, um, but I do read the Bible a lot to Cam as well. You're, if there's Christians watching, you got three non-theists right now who probably read the Bible more than you guys do. Um, that's a guess. But um, can I role play as 
I do a lot of interviews with apologists. Can I role play as them and give you sort of the common things I hear? And can you sort of uh, very briefly, um, you know, maybe, I don't know, 60 seconds or less, kind of, I don't want to say it this way, but knock these out of the park for us? <laughs> uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. So I, I, uh, I critiqued, okay, I'm, uh, I'm going to be voting bottom uh, Bacham right now. He's an apologist. And he would say, I would choose the, to believe the Bible because it's a reliable collection of historical documents written by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses that report supernatural events that took place in, fulfilled, in fulfillment of specific prophecies and claim that their writings are divine rather than human in origin. So let's well, take the first one. No... Yeah, that it's a reliable yeah. historical documents, that they're reliable historical documents. Well, that claim fails as soon as you realize the apologist has to do apologetics, that is, harmonize and try to demonstrate the, the accuracy of these documents, which is in debate. Uh, it's, it's possible the Gospels stem from eyewitnesses, but there's no particular reason to think so. A couple of mid-second century people said so, but they're kind of unreliable on other matters, uh, Papias and Irenaeus and so forth. Uh, they they don't read like eyewitnesses eyewitness documents from the ancient world, and indeed the the whole eyewitness thing for the the Old Testament too came about as part of Protestant rationalism in the 18th century. Uh, these were theists who had a Newtonian mechanical view of the universe, and so did not believe in miracles. Uh, strange as it sounds to us, so this is where the swoon theory came from. For instance, these guys believed the Bible was true, but there couldn't be any miracles because God would be violating his own natural law, so there weren't any. Uh, but the stories all happened. Jesus uh, was crucified and then appeared three days later because he hadn't died on the cross. Uh, and m many, many other rationalizing explanations uh, came about. Well, that meant if there's no miracles, there's no miraculous inspiration safeguarding the inerrancy of the Bible. Yet they wanted to continue to believe the Bible stories happened. So the only way to rationalize that was to say, well, they must have been written by eyewitnesses or in the generation of eyewitnesses. But, but Bob, though this is an arbitrary claim. But Bob, uh, we don't we have a guy named Paul who wrote in the mid 50s that that he saw the risen Jesus and he even mentioned a creed that goes uh, back well, even closer to the time of Jesus. What are you talking about? Well, I think that that uh, passage in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, verses 3 through 11, has all the marks of being an interpolation. Uh, I explain this at some length in a couple of articles, uh, but you, you have to defend the dubious, that is debatable, assertion that it is a creed, that it's pre-Pauline and so on, uh, in the teeth of objections, and one cannot point to a to an issue uh, in debate as if it is settled evidence to use to settle some other question. possible what they say about it is true, but it, it isn't that clear that, that that's even being claimed. And uh, in fact, the, when they say it's a creed, anybody ever notice that a creed is not a set of evidence, but a set of beliefs? Uh, and so if you say, well, I believe that, uh, you know, he appeared to this one and that one. Uh, well, a lot of people do 1900 years later. Suppose you did have someone who you knew was a contemporary. Uh, how is that different from Oral Roberts saying that he saw Jesus the size of King Kong standing beside his prayer tower and telling him to get the uh, donors to give more money? I, I don't know that that didn't happen either, but someone's claim uh, is not enough to say it, and apologists seem, though not realizing it, to simply be proof texting these statements from the Bible as if that were sufficient reason to believe them. That they are arguing implicitly as if the unbeliever accepts the accuracy of the Bible too. But the guys that are arguing against 18th century Protestant rationalists are all long dead. But Bob, and, but uh, Bob, biblical but, critics do not operate that way. But Bob, you're. What I'm hearing you say now is, okay, I just mentioned a, an eyewitness account very early on in the mid-50s, and you're just throwing it out. Like, shouldn't we just throw it all history now? Or if that's the way you're going to think, should, why should we believe uh, that Caesar crossed the Rubicon then? 
Well, in that case, we have uh, the Gallic Wars, uh, and there's no by the the man himself. And of course, that could be pseudepigraphical, but nobody's ever really brought up any reason to suspect it. Uh, and uh, but in the broader sense. All history is tentative and provisional unless somebody has a time machine. And there are things that uh, you would you, you swore all your life were true that turn out not to be. George Washington, not the first president of the United States. That was Elias P. Boudinot, the founder of the New York Bible. He was the president of the Senate, which is all there was before the Constitution. But that made him the president of the United States under the Articles of Confederation. I, I love to tell students that. But, or uh, when was independence declared uh, for, for America? Yes, they. Uh, uh, John Adams told his wife, in the future there'll be fireworks and parades on July 2nd, uh, because that's when the Continental Congress voted to declare independence. All these things, you know, they may not be true. Did Martin Luther nail the theses to the Wittenberg door? Apparently not, et cetera, et cetera. These may be minor details, but with all manner of things, the historian knows some weird thing may come up. You never really know, and all historical judgments are probabilistic, provisional, and tentative, but apologists are rooting for one side. Uh, they're in a game and they're fans of one side. They want certain things to be true, whereas the, the more objective historical approach is to say, we're trying to find out what is true, and it's not that likely we'll ever be sure. You sound, uh, Bob, so there's, Bob, uh, the whole approach Bob, you sound to me like you're just highly overly skeptical about these things. Like, why would anybody make this stuff up? Like, you look at uh, the Gospels. We got women going to the tomb first. Like, who would make that up since the status of women was so lowly back then? Well, on the one hand, in rabbinical law, women's testimony was accepted, contrary to apologist assertions, when it dealt with their... Uh, their area of competence, which had to do with burials and mourning for the dead and so on. And uh, th so there wouldn't have been any problem there. But in fact, to me, it seems much more likely that these stories were made up as part of the women's ritual mourning for the dying and rising God. We know of similar uh, stories of uh, Isis and Nephthys seeking the body of the slain Osiris, Sibeli looking for the body of the slain Attis, and so on and so on, uh, Anat looking for the corpse of Baal, and, and, and then ultimately they rise from the dead. The stories are so similar, and the Zitzim Laban, the context in which they originated, was always a ritual one for the yearly Good Friday vigil and Easter morning ceremonies, though they didn't call them that. It's very easy to see where these stories would have come from. They're, they're really being misused as evidence for the resurrection. Once again, it was a, a ritual thing implying faith and growing out of it, not evidence, not exhibit A to establish these things as historical. Well, but I have to say the consensus of biblical scholars is that there, the tomb was empty, Bob. And this is what really counts. So are you saying now that you even doubt there was a tomb? And that it was empty? Oh uh, Yeah, yeah, I, I guess I am, because the whole story is uh, aiming at a resurrection. Uh, it's like these stories, the passions of these other dying and rising saviors. Um, oh, uh, Craig and Habermas and others say, now look, uh, everybody agrees that uh, Jesus was crucified under Pilate and Joseph of Arimathea buried the body in his tomb and that the women came to see the tomb to anoint him and they found it empty. Well, if, if you're going that far, why should you suddenly jump the track and say you don't believe in the resurrection? This is like saying that there must be an an emerald city of Oz, because otherwise, where does the yellow brick road lead? These things are all part of a story. And uh, of course, the the preceding events are written to lead to a particular finale uh, that you, you don't you, the res, the empty tomb is not the only thing to doubt. Is there any reason to accept what these these documents say about all the preceding stuff with Joseph of Arimathea, Mary Magdalene and so 
on. No, I mean, it might be true, but even then you've got to well, yeah, wonder about the contradictions. We have many reasons to believe that, that we should believe the things in the Gospels. I, I, I could name several prophecies, Daniel 9, 9, Zechariah 9, uh, uh, Isaiah 53, Psalm 22. We have prophecies written centuries before the fact. Do you just discount that? Oh, yes, I do, because there are no such prophecies. It's dubious as to whether there are any messianic prophecies at all in the Old Testament. Many of those texts are royal birth announcements and enthronement oracles, uh, and uh, because there are many other ones uh, in uh, neighboring cultures that sound just the same. Oh, the, the divine son is now going to rule and even rule the nations, and there'll be peace, and animals will be tame, and and uh, People will have long lifespans. It's just common court rhetoric. Uh, they're, like Isaiah 53 is not even in the future tense, nor is Psalm 22. And we have a pretty good idea of where these texts fit into ancient Israel and Judah. Uh, you can only make them into prophecies of Jesus or any Messiah at all by a process of ventriloquism, by reading Christian doctrine into them, which is what the New Testament authors did. They find one that that seems to be about this in the original Old Testament context. Nobody ever has. Okay, so it, it sounds to me that you're so skeptical that you're saying that none of the New Testament's even written by eyewitnesses, or probably not, and, and that uh, this is just all storytelling. But answer me this, Bob. We have the largest religion in the world today called Christianity. We have not even just in the in the Gospels, but in other documents, uh, people attesting to their lives being changed, that they radically changed. You're saying this they, their lives changed just based on a story? In fact, they died for this belief. You're telling me that they just died for a story? Well, um, I uh, remember couple of years ago, a Mormon elder, uh, in the wake of this uh, genetic experiment, this DNA thing that showed that there is no shared data between American Indians and Semitic peoples, which pretty much deep sixed the whole Mormon uh, narrative uh, of the, the American Indians being transplanted, Hebrews and so on. Uh, what did the guy say? Uh, he said, well, uh, I guess it's less important that our stories are true than it is is if we are true to our stories. And I thought, okay, somebody's thinking. Uh, and uh, uh, that's there are many stories that embody ideals that are worth, uh, was there actually an Uncle Sam? No, nobody thinks there was. Uh, and it doesn't matter. Uh, or Socrates, uh, we think we know pretty much about him, but it doesn't really matter. Or the Buddha, what they embody is the thing we want to uh, learn from and ritually reenact uh, in, in baptism, the Lord's Supper, et cetera, et cetera. And lives are changed this way. That just does not settle questions of history. Like think of the, the uh, nobility of, of Mormons and of black Muslims, uh, that uh, the, the many uh, lives were changed from addiction and criminality to being self-sufficient, uh, righteous people through that. I brought that up once at Gordon Conwell's seminary and somebody said, well, you know, those are satanic counterfeits. And I said, well, I guess you know better than the New Testament because uh, in Galatians it says the works of the flesh are, are plain enough uh, and it lists all these bad things. Uh, fruit of the Spirit, however, is just the opposite. And I said, I guess you know better. You seem to think that uh, the, the uh, works of the flesh look just like the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, yeah, I would watch my step uh, lest I start attributing the work of the Spirit to Beelzebub, uh, as in uh, it happens in the Gospels. And, and you can, as Francis Schaeffer used to say, you can't establish truth by a nose count. I mean, this is the family feud epistemology. Uh, I, I got to agree with the consensus. Uh, and uh, this, this nonsense about what uh, the consensus of New Testament scholars think, 
of course, that Jesus existed and was crucified. Well, it was also the consensus of scholars that Jesus should be put to death, right? The story of the Sanhedrin. I mean, that just doesn't matter. Everybody thought the earth was flat at one point. Uh, it just doesn't make any difference because you don't know why people think that. And, and uh, I would now think that as I used to, to that uh, many uh, apologists and mainstream New Testament scholars are simply so immersed in the Christian plausibility structure that they cannot, quote, think outside the box. They just can't take it seriously. Okay, well, uh, psychologically, uh, I could be wrong, but uh, at least I, I don't depend on a, you know, a group consensus that for my views. Well, Bob, it's obvious to me that you're being very stubborn, and I think— uh, I'm going to try one more thing here. To um, I want to appeal to your sense of reason. We have a Bible composed of 66 books written by over 40 thought authors over uh, a millennia of years telling a consistent story. And this is probably the best evidence of all. Once you take the cumulative case, sure, you can doubt little pieces of evidence in the Bible anywhere. I understand that. But when you look at it cumulatively, the undesigned coincidences of the Gospels, of how they relate to each other, it is just the probability of this just being made up and false is inconceivable to me. How can you not see that? Well, uh, there is no consistent message between the Old and New Testaments, nor within either one. They deal with similar names, concepts, and so on, but just look at any book on Old Testament theology, von Rad or uh, uh, any of these guys, they have a heck of a time trying to synthesize a continuous Old Testament theology. Uh, and no matter what, it's like uh, William Hamilton said, you you got a storm coming up on a house, you got seven windows, but only five storm windows. What are you going to do? You, they can never uh, come up with a theme that would explore, that would include everything. The New Testament is just as bad. Oh yeah, it's always got to do with Jesus, but what's the gospel exactly? And what happened to Jesus? There is no such consistency as this apologetic argument imagines, especially once you realize that the Gospels are interdependent. They're not four different eyewitnesses describing the same traffic accident. Uh, it, it looks like um, this Gospel used that one and changed this regard but kept that and so on. It's just not the way they, they, uh, they're, they're framing it. That's what I mean by saying they're peddling a false idea when they just say, oh yeah, four different eyewitnesses, surely they know that's not true. Surely they know the basics of for, of source criticism. And so they're, they're promoting a Sunday school version of things. Okay, let's end scene there. How did I do? Did I convince you, Bob, that I was a Christian apologist? <laughs> oh, yeah, very. Yeah. <laughs> um. I had, and and felt, I was, too. I mean, I used to use these arguments before I saw through them. What were you going to say, Cam? Yeah, that felt very uh, convincing, but also awkward. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't awkward for me. Uh, no, you did a very also, good job, um, both of you. <laughs> uh, I, I have to say, Bob, the... the Probably the most influential thing um, I ever learned from you was a, a way to uh, appreciate the Bible outside of the, the lens of faith and the, the lens of Christian dogma. Um, I, I was a Christian and listening to the Bible Geek, your podcast, and reading some of your books was quite instrumental in changes in my perspective of um, how to read it differently. And like you've said on many occasions before, um, I think the Bible becomes more interesting um, when you allow yourself to see um, solutions to uh, problems that come about through the text outside of um, the faith assumptions. And I really appreciate that. Um, because it's it's meant that I've been able to 
enjoy the Bible, um, you know, outside of that context. Yeah, that's my experience. Imagine if there was a sect of fundamentalist believers in Greek mythology uh, that uh, said that the Iliad and the Odyssey are literal history uh, and uh, that uh, those gods exist and there was a real Achilles and a real Hercules and all that. And uh, they wanted this taught in schools. The people that would object the most strenuously would be classicists who love the Iliad and the Odyssey. They're saying you, they would say you're making a mockery of this. Uh, you can't really understand it as long as you're trying to make it be historically true. You, you're twisting the text. Uh, and I uh, like to tell people, look, you want to understand the Bible, so do I. It's my own. Uh, and I prefer the approach that actually makes sense of its puzzles uh, rather than one that says, gee, I, I don't understand this, that, or the other thing. But when we get to heaven, there'll be a big uh, seminar where they'll tell us how it really made sense. Like, how, how come the voice at the baptism said, this is my beloved son and you are my beloved son? That's what I've heard deferred to heaven. Well, we're going to be up there and they'll say, okay, ready for this? The drum roll, may I have the envelope, please? And they'll read what the solution was. Like, Son of a gun, why didn't I think of that? Uh, I mean, that is just desperate. You're admitting that, uh, I mean, if, if the Bible is not clear, what's the use of it? I mean, if, if ambiguity and contradiction are worse than errors. You know how people say, well, oh, these are only apparent contradictions. Hey, pal, I got news for you. If your view of the Bible's authority is the plain sense of the text, the apparent meaning is authoritative, apparent contradictions are the deadliest kind. Uh, and uh, there, there goes biblical authority right out the window. And so I, I feel like taking the high ground, I am the champion of the Bible, not those who uh, insist on making an idol of it. Yeah, I, when it comes to apparent contradictions, I very rarely talk about them on my channel because I know it's, well, let me say it this way. I think it is very easy for someone to come up with a solution, but they are, I, how did you say it on John McClatchy's channel? Um, you said, ask yourself a question. If you're coming up with an explanation just to get, it, get you out of a tough, tight spot, maybe you're not really that concerned about the truth or something like that. I'm paraphrasing you. Yeah, that's right. Uh, that raises the big question of your, your presuppositions or your your paradigm or your plausibility structure. You know, there's these, these uh, tortured attempts to get out of the problem of who did Peter speak to when he was denying Jesus. It's, it's different people in the different gospels, a maiden, a guard at the door, some soldiers, some guy, etc. And uh, if you try to get them all in, as Harold Lindzel said, you got to have at least six denials of Jesus, even though no gospel says that, right? Every one of them says three denials. Jesus doesn't say, you know, you're going to be denying a blue streak, at least three, probably six denials. Why does it not say that? And and uh, But how does this look good to Harold Lindzel? How can he say this with a straight face? Well, because given what he wants to believe, his overarching framework of biblical authority, the six denials thing sounds quite plausible to him because it backs up his main criterion. But if you're just asking, well, wait a minute, let's be like Martin Luther and interpret the Bible as we would any other ancient document according to the common usage and vocabulary and all that, would we really think that uh, that is, is a likely reading? And, and ever and again, the, the apologist is just circling around. Uh, and uh, rather than seeking the truth, he's already got it in his back pocket. Yeah, I, I, that's exactly right. I, uh, if there's any apologist listening right now, and I think you'll actually agree with what Bob is saying, what I'm about to say, is that you have already decided what is true, and you're committed to that. And apologetics is defending it. You're defending what you have already committed yourself to. So this is not a truth-seeking. Apologetics is not about truth-seeking. It's about, hey, I already got the truth. Let me defend it. Cameron, you want to say something? 
Yeah, my way of thinking about um, the implications of their solutions to these apparent contradictions is to ask the question, if it really were the case that the combined version of these accounts occurred, why is it that the text only says these small little pieces of it? So, for example, if it was really the case that Judas hung on a tree, fell, and then his guts spilled out, why is it that Acts only says that um, his guts spilled out and uh, the other accountant, uh, is it Matthew, um, says yeah. that he hung on a tree? Um, it's these kinds, it, you're only really creating problems for yourself. And if you never actually ask those questions that arise, you are short circuiting and you are, you're just accepting what is easy um, and not what is hard. It's like the old slogan, my mind's made up, don't confuse me with the facts. That's not really a caricature, uh, because uh, most people are, who like the apologists and clap for them at the debates are more than happy just to swat these problems away like gnats. They're, they're not really curious about what the deal is with Judas. It's just we want to get this off the table because it's embarrassing. We'd like to go back to our dogmatic slumber from which we've been momentarily aroused. And that's just not uh, intellectually honest. I loved so much about InterVarsity that they were always talking about being intellectually honest. And uh, I, I still... Uh, um, um, I look back fondly on my involvement with them and reading all their books and all that, but I came to realize they're the ones slanting the thing. Uh, they, they don't realize it, but they're, they're sort of uh, de deceiving themselves. And this is a, a good example of it. Uh, whereas if you say, well, wait a second, isn't it interesting that the version in Acts where he just bursts open uh, like a weak old corpse from the gases and his, his uh, guts fly out. This looks an awful lot like the description of Antiochus Epiphanes' death in one of the books of the Maccabees, with which Luke was certainly familiar. And then you think of the Matthew version where he hangs himself. Boy, that looks a lot like the hanging of Ahithophel in uh, Second Samuel, after he betrayed David, etc. Uh, what's more likely that he he took uh, that he hanged himself from a string a a on the uh, the edge of a precipice and then hurtled down uh, to the bottom and just splattered? That doesn't fit either story. I mean, is that really likely when and when you've got uh, it a uh, uh, live option that it's just taken from these other stories. Nobody knew what the heck happened to Judas, which is probably because there wasn't any Judas. Uh, but this this is a great segue. Yeah, and, uh, the point is is that it just it doesn't the the combined theory just doesn't explain why um, Matthew and the author of X um, tell their sub details. Hey, guys. Uh, yeah, why would it differ that much when both are little capsule summaries, ostensibly? Hey, Bob, I um, I was watching HBO Rome um, a couple nights back, and uh, one guy was talking to another guy asking for uh, marital advice about women, his wife. <laughs> and he said, um, well, with women, you got to speak very gently and tell them that you love them. And so I think that's the perfect strategy when it comes to Christians and the historicity of Jesus. You got to speak very softly and gently and tell them that you love them, that you care about them. So I, mm. I um, want to talk about sort of even at least to have the believer, the Christian understand where guys like us are coming from by taking it off the Bible and putting it onto something else. And so let's say I gave you a book, Bob. It has no title on it, no publication in the front cover, anything like that, just the text inside. And I asked you to read it. And then I asked you to tell me, how would you determine whether this book 
belongs in the history section of the library or the fictional novel section of the library? What things would you look for in that book? Well, um, I'm thinking of what uh, Kata Hamburger, a, a German literary critic said, uh, and uh, I can't think of the name of the book now, but uh, she, she said that uh, you can generally tell because in fiction, the narrator knows things that are not apparent from or explicitly drawn from any record. Like uh, the worst case would be when the narrator seems to know what a character is thinking without them having said it, uh, or descriptions of, of individual scenes. Uh, somebody enters the room and they do this and they say that. A historian couldn't know such things. Uh, and uh, if, if we see uh, one of these docudramas on TV, the very name uh, the very term implies you're fictionalizing history uh, because you've uh, made it look like you're viewing a, you know, people talking in a room. Historians don't have that information. I like what Hermann Gunkel said in his uh, commentary on Genesis. He says that uh, according to Exodus, uh, the Hebrews were in Egypt for over four centuries and we hear nothing about it except that they were there and initially honored, eventually oppressed. And yet the biblical writer knows about kitchen table arguments between Abraham and Sarah about Hagar. He knows what was said in a dialogue. It's impossible. There's no way that, that you would forget four centuries of your people's history and yet have uh, Abraham and Sarah like on an, on an episode of Father Knows Best. Uh, and uh, it's so just that the Bible narrative... Go ahead. It's, it's impossible unless it's inspired by God. Yeah, but then we're throwing the whole history out. I mean, then you're talking about automatic writing. Uh, how would they know, like channelers, Edgar Casey? Oh, yes, you were uh, the guy that uh, washed Pontius Pilate's chariot uh, in a previous life. And you said to Jesus one day, he's just uh, making it up or his subconscious is. Same sort of a thing. If you say inspired, you're, you're, you're like Rudolf Steiner. There is some psychic way of knowing about the past apart from evidence. Well, uh, you could be right, I suppose, but it, it, it's arbitrary. There's no way to know. So you don't really know and it doesn't count as evidence. It, it's the very, that's one thing that D.E. Ninem says about Mark that uh, says, this does not sound like the writings of an eyewitness. Now, somebody who was there and, and did know what Abraham said to Sarah about Hagar, for instance, how would it read? Uh, there's nothing like that in Mark. And uh, however, if you look at uh, an admittedly pseudepigraphical work like the Acts of John, uh, you, you at least whoever wrote that, and it's it's transparently fictive, but whoever wrote it understood what an eyewitness reminiscence would sound like. John says, brethren, let me tell you some of the things that happened when I was with Jesus. Uh, once I was uh, walking beside him on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, and I noticed that his foots left no print, his feet left no footprints. Uh, once I reached out to touch him on the shoulder, and my hand went right right through as if he were a ghost, etc., etc. This stuff didn't happen. Nobody thinks it did, but at least this guy knew what it would sound like. It would be like table talk. Uh, and uh, like, you know, the, of, of Martin Luther or Hitler or any of these guys, oh, I remember when the Fuhrer said so-and-so. Uh, and uh, that's what Mark does not sound like. It, it's just little... Uh, stories, little anecdotes that are just like those of the Greek philosophers or myths even. It's not that kind of a genre. Uh, even the so supposedly historical narratives in the 
the Old Testament, uh, Kings, Samuel, and so on, they don't sound that way. Uh, and uh, it's it's just people find the Bible so beguiling uh, that they just get pulled into it, which you're supposed to do. It's well-written literature, but you, you begin to forget about... I mean, I, I knew people back in 77 when Star Wars had just come out who so wanted to believe that world was real that they started convincing themselves that it was real in some other dimension. Well, that's kind of what you're doing. Well, there's no real evidence, but but uh, I, I just want to be a part of this thing, so it must be true. And if he was resurrected from the dead, one day I will be too. And it's so it, it's it's a real weird uh, mulligan stew of things you want to believe and the effectiveness of the literature as literature, uh, adherence to religious dogma, which you're afraid of not believing because you'll go to hell and so on. It, it's all a big mess. Yes. Uh, so, it's so difficult for people to, to separate them. Like, I, I want to have give, uh, say, the believer some tools. So if, if a believer was given a book and they didn't know if it is fiction or history, one th what I'm hearing you say, if I can sum it up, is if you read it and you have like this third person, all seeing narrator telling a story like that's a signal that it's more fiction than fact or history. Is that what you're saying? Uh, yeah, like, how did anybody know? How did Mark know what Jesus said in Gethsemane? He s explains very clearly that none of the disciples were in hearing range. How did Mark know what the, the risen Jesus said to the, or the angel, the young man said to the women at the tomb, uh, when um, it's, it ends by saying, they told, the women fled and told nothing to anyone because they were scared to death. Well, how'd Mark know about it? Uh, and and th these things are quite consistent with fiction writing, but not with history. And uh, who could remember the Sermon on the Mount, for example, uh, 10 minutes later? I mean, it's not even that long, but who could possibly remember that from one hearing? And, and just again and again, does it fit into reality? Where would this narrative have come from? Yeah, Who and I, I think or remember these things in such detail. I think a lot of Christians would agree with that type of idea when it's not the Bible. Like if you have this book and you're trying to figure it out, if you hear this all seeing third person. But here's another one I have. Tell me what you think of it. If I was reading a book and it said in 1970, uh, Paul uh, needed some information and he Googled it on the internet, I would say, wait a minute. There was, he, there was no internet, there was no Google in 1970, so this is not historical. Is there anything like that, that we have something uh, that just doesn't fit for that time period in, let's say, the Gospels? Which is the best one in your uh, opinion? Well, yeah, the, the, I'd say the best is in the Gospel of John, where in chapter 9, the man born blind he uh, forthrightly tells what happened to him, and they ask his parents, is this true? He says, hey, leave me out of it. Uh, he was there, ask him. And John says, well, that's because the order had already gone out that if anybody believed in Jesus, they're getting kicked out of the synagogue. But then seven chapters later, I think it is, somewhere in the Last Supper, Jesus says the time is coming when uh, people, w when you'll be kicked out of the synagogue for believing in me. What do you mean? Uh, it's already the case, isn't it? And this and various other things in John are ways of saying, okay, here's what's actually happening in our day, you and me, reader. Uh, but l let's uh, have Jesus address it. Uh, just like on... Uh, billboards you've probably seen where it has some smart ass remark and uh and it's signed god like if you uh if you uh think it's hot today uh then keep cursing and you'll see how hot hell uh, cursing at the traffic and then you'll see how hot it is in hell signed god i see this and there are loads of these and i, I think is that an isaiah 
You know, is, is that in Jeremiah? Where, where does God say this? Well, the people writing it don't seriously believe God whispered this in their ear, and they don't think you're going to believe it. It's just a literary, it's just a license, and that's what they're doing in the Bible. It's not really a question of, oh my gosh, I uh, left this loose end, uh, now they're going to realize this is bunk. No, you just have to understand that it's literature, and anachronism is often uh, an instance of that. Any place where Jesus speaks of how the disciples can expect to be persecuted, uh, that seems to me anachronistic. He's already treated as if he's some kind of outlawed heretic when in terms of what actually happens in the gospel stories, he's not. He's just a popular preacher. And, and it's you begin to realize, yeah, there is an, an, an anachronistic overlay uh, to, to make it easy to apply uh, the wisdom imagined that Jesus had to our problems. So an anachronisms are, are not just goofs. Uh, they're, they're often uh, pointers to say, you, you, you see the relevance of this? And uh, so that's another sign of it being fictive. Is there something simpler? Like I can, I can imagine the Christians interpreting their way through that, but is there something like, I remember you, hearing you say something like um, the term rabbi didn't become popular until late first century, and yet here the apologists are claiming that Jesus is known as rabbi before then. So how is that possible? That, that'd be like my internet example in the 1970s. Yeah, I, that is a big problem, as is the whole question of Galilean synagogues. Uh, there's no evidence that there were any. Uh, and uh, this, um, there, there were in, in Judea, and there were in the Mediterranean diaspora. It's, it's, you know, there's no reason there shouldn't have been, but archaeology uh, doesn't give us any evidence. Now, that might change, but it's a little surprising given the number of them that the Gospels imply. But in, there were in the time after the fall of Jerusalem when the Gospel writers were working. So that is naturally explained as saying, well, they just pictured circumstances of their own day. They, didn't really, they weren't in a position to know things were different. Uh, another one is in Matthew 23 when it says, Listen to what the scribes say, because after all, they occupy the seat of Moses. That appears to be a second century development from Jewish sources, uh, which implies Matthew's writing uh, decades after the supposed time of Jesus. Uh, or, or my favorite, Jesus tells the crowd, uh, whoever would be my disciple, let him take up his cross and follow me. Now that surely... Uh, it presupposes that the, the reader uh, knows that Jesus went to the cross, and you may have to be persecuted the same way. First Peter puts it just that way. Uh, but it, could Jesus have said this pre-crucifixion to just a bunch of hillbillies in Galilee? What the heck were they supposed to think? Well, of course, it's not aimed at them. Uh, it's aimed at the reader who knows Jesus was crucified. So there's an anachronism which makes it pretty darn clear. The real point is Jesus is saying this to you, Christian reader. Uh, and whether he ever said it, I know some people will say, well, this could have been a, a zealot recruiting slogan. Yeah, as, as F.C. Bauer said, anything is possible, but the historian wants to know what is probable, and that ain't. So, Cam, um, we got two, so we got this book. We're trying to figure out if it's historical, more historical, more fictional. We got two so far, this third-person narrative. We have anachronism, which is just a fancy word uh, saying that something's not fitting in for its time period. Um, can you think of any other things that you would personally use? Yeah, so um, there's a couple that you find commonly in fictional literature. Um, for example, the usage of literary devices, um, like plot devices, uh, for example, dramatic irony, or um, the usage of symbolic names um, that in help interpretability of the story. Um, an example specific to uh, uh, Mark would be uh, Mark's use of what scholars have called 
Mark and Sandwiches, where you have um, mm. an outer narrative enclosing an inner narrative, and they are meant to be interpreted together and with each part um, helping to understand them both. Do, yeah, are there um, any others like that that you th can think of with respect to the Gospels? Well, I love the thing with the uh, the names. Uh, of course, many names that people really do have are symbolic, but you have to wonder, like uh, in John 3, a character is called Nicodemus, and he it says he is a ruler of the people, which just happens to be what the name Nicodemus means. Uh, or there is this guy who, this tax gatherer, who is explaining that uh, he gives away half his income and all that stuff. His name is Zacchaeus, which seems to, to come from the root Zacchae, charitable giving. Uh, Martha is the hostess, and her name means lady of the house. Uh, Jairus' daughter, uh, Jesus, he goes to Jesus asking him to raise her up uh, from the sickbed. And what do you know? Jairus means he will awaken. Uh, and and so on down the line, you you, you start uh, wondering, or, or Judas Iscariot. Iscariot could mean a few things, but the, the one, my favorite uh, guess is that it means the false one, Ishkaria, the man of falsehood. What a coincidence. Uh, and, and so on. It, it just seems to me that's one. But an, another kind of one would be something grossly improbable given the circumstances uh, like uh, that Pontius Pilate would have deliberated for 10 seconds over whether Jesus should be crucified uh, whether he would be basically begging the crowd of nobodies uh, to let him let Jesus go impossible uh, Pontius Pilate was a Jew hating tyrant and we know enough about him from Philo and Josephus there is no way this guy would act uh, as he does in the Gospels uh, or uh, worse yet Caiaphas is there at this Sanhedrin hearing on Passover Eve, when every devout Jew had to be home having the Passover supper. This is like uh, you're there on the Easter vigil in Rome, and suddenly you see the Pope headed for uh, a pizza joint. Is what the heck? What look look at that? What's he doing out here? It's just outrageously stupid, as if somebody just had no idea of the circumstances. Circumstances, or Jesus uh, forbidding entry to the court of the Gentiles after he overthrows the tables and stuff. This thing was as big as 15 football fields. Uh, how could he possibly have prevented people from coming in by throwing lightning bolts? Or, I mean, it's just, you can tell people didn't really understand what they were describing. And uh, it just, or another one, um, some of the parables uh, imply that whoever told them knew nothing about agricultural conditions in Palestine. Uh, the um, or the shepherd, uh, he uh, he's rounding up the sheep, and he's keeping close guard on them because there are predators around there, right? And so he he counts them up. Okay, we got the ninety nine. Where's that other one? I better go look for it. I think I'll leave 99 of them unprotected while I go out. It's, it's like you, you can't, somebody didn't think this through. Uh, and uh, again and again, uh, you, you got stuff like this. If it's fiction, what the heck? Uh, but if, if it matters uh, to you that, that, oh, yes, this has to be literally true, you, you're just... Uh, you're just developing a bad conscience. I want to. Uh, you you know better. I want to be very very clear about this because I I really want the believer the Christian to understand where we're coming from and I and I want them to understand. Okay, forget about the Bible for a second. If you have this book in front of you and you're trying to figure out if this is historical or not or fictional, if you agree with us that when you're reading and you see this third person all seeing narrator talking. That's a clue that maybe it's fiction. It doesn't guarantee it. So that's one thing we mentioned. The second thing is um, what Cam just said, uh, literary devices. You know, if you see things like irony, maybe this is fiction. 
uh, foreshadowing. Maybe this is fiction. Um, and, and Bob, you were mentioning improbable events. I love Bob's analogy. You have two analogies I love, and one of them is the Superman one. So, Christian, if you're reading a book and you have no idea what this book is, but you're reading it and you hear about a man who has a job at a newspaper company and you hear that he has a girlfriend and you know her name and, and what he likes to eat and so forth, just mundane things. You have no reason to doubt that this is not historical. But what if you found out later as you read further that this man, his name is Clark Kent, and that later on in the story, you find out this same man can now cut steel with his laser eyes. Do you still think this is a historical narrative, or do you now doubt it a bit? And I think for guys like Bob, Cam, and myself, we say, well, okay, we can read things in the Gospels of like where Jesus went, real places, maybe even real people. But just in the same way, you would doubt Superman is real based on even if you know the Clark Kent, you, you would start doubting Clark Kent once you know about Superman. In the same way, you start doubting the historical Jesus once you know about right. walking on water and raising the dead and all this. Uh, as truth seekers, I think that's a good thing to do is to doubt that. Do um, you have any comments on that? Like, I'm, I'm trying to appeal as gently, softly, kindly as I can to the Christians that this is how we're processing this. Well, it's like uh, of, of the issue next door, right, is uh, that of the principle of analogy, which tells you what sort of thing you may be reading. Uh, I, I like to say, uh, like you, the one you mentioned with the superheroes, suppose um, that uh, somebody were to say, you know, there, there's Superman, and uh, he really existed, but then there's Captain Marvel and the Martian Manhunter, who uh, were very much like him, just different color costumes and stuff. They fly through the air, superhuman strength and vulnerable, heat vision and all that. But, of course, Superman is the only real one. These others are ridiculous. Why would you give privileged treatment to Superman, unless he just happened to be your favorite, what reason could you give never having actually seen any of these people? Uh, why should you believe in Superman if if you know Captain Marvel and the Manhunter are fictive? Uh, it's like um, it, you're engaged in special pleading or another one. I like a guy comes home from work, plops down on the chair, turns on cable and uh and the first thing he sees is a giant reptile smashing the skyscrapers of a city. Uh, what's his first reaction? Oh, well, it's the news channel. Uh, no, uh, he realizes that uh, he's he's turned on Comet TV or the Sci-Fi Channel or something. How does he know that? Uh, well, because uh, it's not that it's unthinkable that there could be Godzilla or something. I mean, it, it would be real weird, but I suppose that might be possible. Uh, but have you ever seen any such thing? Do you know of anyone who ever saw that? Uh, no, but you have seen plenty of Toho Studios monster flicks. Uh, and you say, boy, this he's got plates on his back that are odd shaped, and he's got this radioactive breath. Kind of reminds me of Godzilla. Is there any reason to think it's not Godzilla? I mean, surely you'd say by analogy, right? This doesn't fit any news I've ever seen, where if it happened, it would surely be prominent. But it fits like a glove to all these cheap monster flicks. Well, I don't know, but but my guess is it's got to be a monster flick. And and that's the, the same thing. If, if you ha read a story about some guy walking on water and so on, and his name is... Uh, uh, Melvin instead of Jesus, you wouldn't give that a, any thought. A TM people that claim that they can levitate, you wouldn't take that seriously for a split second. But somebody ascending into heaven after 40 days, well, that, that really happened. Why? Because you have this vested interest in believing this is an infallible narrative. But if it's, you don't care about genres and what distinguishes them. But if you get into apologetics, I'm afraid it becomes your job to care. Uh, you've got to raise these questions 
and explain why you're why it really is Godzilla or Superman really exists. And I, I just think it's I appeal to Christians to say Christianity is supposed to be about the truth, right? Yeah. Uh, can you really say that's what you're interested in, or do you, don't you just want your favorite story to be true? So I think part of the difficulty, and I can explain. Um, sort of empathize because as a Christian at one point in time, I hadn't actually read much literature from the period in question. My, you know, my education on the Greco-Roman period and before um, was, you know, it, almost entirely just by reading the Gospels and reading, um, you know, the the Bible itself. And so in, in the case that you're talking about, you know, I've seen Godzilla movies, um, you know, so I have that analogy. But with respect to the Bible, when I was a Christian, I hadn't read any translation fables. I hadn't read any stories about Romulus or Anana or... Um, or Mithra or like any other type of figure who um, was, you know, believed or placed in history, but yet had these um, magnificent tales told about their passions and their, um, their, their struggles or their deaths and their raisings or any of these other types of details. So the analogy just wasn't there for me. Um, and right. I think that that's part of the problem is that like, if, like because they already have the belief, it also makes them reluctant to um, to really truly investigate those things. And for them, if they read about it, it doesn't count as an analogy because there are always differences one can find between the stories. Um, and yeah, I, th that's my understanding of and my empathy towards why it's hard for the principle of analogy to apply to the gospels. Well, I think it does if you know about it, but you are completely right about how you wouldn't expect uh, the average uh, intelligent Christian to know about this stuff. Why Why should he or she? So I think you're, you're right. It's just that's why I say I'm only interested in uh, confuting the claims of apologists who must know better and therefore just trying to... Uh, reassure the the faithful that they needn't worry about this uh when uh, if you pretend to have any scholarly interest uh, you better worry about it and uh, yeah i completely yeah, agree that's right i mean I, I don't think you should look down on the people that don't know about this of course why would they so uh, yeah i think that the uh, the apologists uh um they're doing like what I was saying before. They they don't allow the analogy because there's always some way to explain it away. Um, there's always some some difference that they make to be of central importance between the accounts that they can't see them as being in the same group. I, I want to um, do a speed round now, Bob. Are you okay with speed rounds? True or false? Oh, yeah. But uh, so... I hope people watch the replay and I hope that they've gathered some forget about the Bible for a second, forget about the Gospels. If you agree with our sort of criteria of how to determine fiction from fact using a, an, an anonymous book, um, just all we ask is for consistency. Like if you agree with it in this case, hopefully you're consistent and apply that to the Bible and the Gospel later. But here's the speed round. So. I'll, um, I don't want to set a false dichotomy, but I want you to answer true or false. <laughs> and Cam, maybe you can even come up with some too, because I'm just going to do this off the top of my head. And um, sure. so true or false, Bob, Abraham existed. False. Moses existed. No, false. Uh, the 12 disciples existed. Unlikely, probably false. Paul, the Apostle Paul, who is formerly known as Saul, existed. Yes, though I think he's uh, probably Simon Magus. Um, the Gospels were written before 70 AD. No, nah, no way. Um, the 
the Gospels were written before 100 AD? Doubtful. I'd say no. You have any speed round questions, Cam? Sure. Um, the New Testament canon came about through an organic process with different Gospels being used in different churches. Yeah, I'd say so. True. Um, that Jesus was a, a small-time, unknown um, faith healer or apocalyptic prophet. If he existed, probably, but I doubt that. Well, did we ask that one yet? Jesus existed. True or false? Uh, false. I, I don't know that, but I think yeah. not. Okay. Um, oh, here's one uh, off the top of my head. Um, the author, whoever wrote Luke, borrowed from Josephus. Yes, true. That uh, true or false, the Gospels are influenced by um, Greek literature outside the Old Testament. True. True or false, there's uh, parallels between the Gospel of Mark and Homer's Odyssey. True. This is fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we, have, we have an oracle with us tonight. <laughs> true or false, oh, Hallelujah. Mark was the first Gospel written. True. I'm interested to know your thoughts on, or true or false, uh, Luke had access to Matthew. False. Could be, but I don't think so. The Jesus, true or false, the Jesus talked about in the Gospels is really the Jesus of 66 AD named Jesus Ben, what's his name, Cam, that Josephus talks about? Ben Ananias or Ben? Uh, Jesus Ben Ananias. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I think so. Oh. So the passion narrative seems to be based on that. Okay, so you're saying true that the Jesus written about in the Gospels is probably from a guy named Jesus Ben Ananias, who Josephus talked about uh, that existed around 66 AD. Or talked about in 66 yeah. AD. Okay. Um, interesting. What about, um, I, I've heard some scholars conjecture connections between Vespasian and Jesus. Uh, I don't know about that uh, theory. Is it a matter of when Jesus would have lived? or They... Uh, I'd have to look up who, who it was. I was reading about it recently, but um, they identify like a number of different things that each character does, um, which are similar to one another. I, I wasn't convinced by it, but I thought it was interesting. Well, I know uh, Joe Atwill thinks that uh, the Jesus character is somehow supposed to be the, the, the Emperor Titus, but I find the theory kind of confusing. Uh, it's possible. Uh, some people say Jesus is really a kind of Roman propaganda version of Julius Caesar. I, I don't, uh, that doesn't seem likely. I mean, or another says that Jesus was Augustus, uh, but it's very difficult to, to argue that persuasively because many of the parallels, and, and they're not all that many, uh, are easily explicable in terms of just the general mythological background of a saint or a hero being the son of God and of ancient healing techniques and all that. So it's That's, hard to know. Yeah. If, that's exactly right. It's like how Jesus, especially in his portrayal in Matthew, fits so squarely within the rank Raglan, um, the like you know Lord Raglan's uh, various you know that mythotype. So it's hard to see 
direct parallels between characters when you have this general trough of um, you know mythos that have influenced it. True or false, Bob? Um, first, Sometimes, though. We, we got some questions in the chat, so I want to get some some more of them, but we're going to do it in the form of true and false. So I'm, I'm people in the chat, if you have questions for, for Bob, let's do it in the form of true or false, because we've already gone over an hour, and I don't want to take too much of your time, Bob. But uh, true or false, 1 Corinthians 15 is the second century interpolation. Oh, true. True, okay. Um. The Gospels. I have a, oh, go ahead, Cap. Uh, one from uh, my friend uh, Troy is uh, the plain reading in Acts four. Should we understand that as being uh, Ill illiterate, as in like unlettered, or some kind of technical term um, denoting like status of education? Uh, this is when uh, the Sanhedrin notices that Peter is uh, is uneducated. Uh, um, I I wouldn't press it to th insist that it means he can't read anything, uh, but I but it certainly must mean he's he's not studied. And in fact, in a parallel scene in the Gospel of John, when Jesus has been speaking, uh, people marvel that he is not studied. And uh, this is part of a broad uh, myth theme, also used of Joseph Smith and Muhammad at uh, wildly different times, saying that, uh, you see, th this guy, the stuff he says, it will flesh and blood has not revealed it to him, uh, but my father in heaven. How could a bumpkin like this possibly be so eloquent? It must be that he's speaking from God. And uh, in fact, who knows? So it's a mythic theme anyway. But I think the point is he's just not educated enough to have been so eloquent. True or false, the Quran is a natural sequel to the Old Testament and New Testament. I, it doesn't. It's in the same ba broad framework, but it, it does not seem to me to be a, a direct continuation. Like the, you could say the Book of Mormon is a direct continuation of part of the Old Testament and, and the Book of Acts in the New. But I don't see that much continuity with uh, with the Quran. True or false, the book of Mark is a passion play narrative, a screenplay. Could be. I think uh, Benjamin W. Smith argued that. I uh, doubt that partly because it would be too long if you tried to picture, the, act out those scenes. Though it's a short work, I, that seems to me to be way too long for uh, even a ritual drama, though possibly... Yeah, my question around that is um, when you see within Mark that it has all of these A, B, C, B, A type of intercalation structures, they seem to be more literary than something that you would act out. Um, that was my naive thoughts on it. True or false? Yeah, you're right. The chiasm business. True or false? God exists. Uh, false. <laughs> True or false, there is more evidence for Jesus than Julius Caesar. Oh, false. These are coming from the, the text. Um, True or false, we have contemporary evidence for Jesus. False. Even if Josephus is authentic, he didn't live at the same time, though it's no question it's it's an interpolation. Um, true or false, the Q source existed. True, I think. Okay. True or false, you have a book coming out soon. Yeah, um, I, I think before Christmas we're going to get volumes two and three out of uh, Holy Fable. Uh, the second one, well, the first one was Holy Fable, the Old Testament undistorted by faith. Uh, the second one will be um, 
uh, will be uh, the Gospels and Acts undistorted by faith, and the third, the Epistles and Revelation undistorted by faith. It won't be the same publisher because he got sick of my political views and uh, didn't want to be associated with them, so I'm putting them out myself now. Oh, good for you. Uh, Cam, when you hold out uh, up his book, you're supposed to wave your hand. Ah, there we go. Yeah. And also show a little cleavage, have some yeah, respect. But, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Is there anything else you want to plug or promote your website? Uh, how can people find you? Like, let's say there's a Christian out there who is not fundamental or dogmatic, but just wants to, you know, maybe learn a little bit more. What's the best way to reach you? Uh, well, my uh, uh, email address is uh, criticus, uh, C-R-I-T-I-C-U-S, uh, at AOL.com. So I'm happy for people to email me directly. I do have like an archive of various sermons, short stories, articles and such columns uh, on my website, robertmprice.mindvendor.com. Uh, and uh, I have a Patreon account also where I put up stuff um, that's not available elsewhere and where I do the, uh, the human Bible, a kind of a cousin of the Bible geek. Yeah, that's what I was just about to mention. So I, I would totally recommend people becoming a patron if you appreciate um, Dr. Price's work. Um, the Human Bible is an awesome uh, podcast available for patrons via Patreon. And obviously the Bible Geek, uh, uh, long running, just treasure trove of um, wonderfully funny and educational material on the Bible. Um, and you can also ask questions uh which uh, Dr. Price will hopefully answer through the Bible game. Yeah, and even if you're a... Yeah, I virtually answer all of them. Yeah, uh, even I was going to say, even if you are a... I said earlier, if you're not a fundamentalist, but if you are a fundamentalist and you kind of dislike everything Bob had to say here today, still go check out his website. Uh, if anything, you know, it's it's in your canon of ideas of uh, just maybe how to argue against guys like Bob, um, if you know where they're coming from. But, um, but be careful. If you go to his website and others like his, um, you might actually learn something. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that was rude, well, right? I treat every questioner... Uh, with respect, uh, you won't get any kind of nasty uh, response from me. And uh, I, uh, again, don't care what anybody believes. In the debates I've done, my favorite part is audience questions, because I have virtually never had anybody hostile or aggressive. Uh, I've always been so pleased that, that uh, conservative evangelical Christians that have bothered to ask questions really want to understand something I've said, and, and it's always real dialogue. Uh, so I feel the same way about anybody that wants to uh, send me a question. Well, you're the Moses in my life, Bob. You kind of look like him. <laughs> I wish I didn't exist. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> um, a bit like Santa too, right? <laughs> but um, oh yeah, right, right. This uh, I have a a, a request, um, and you know, feel free to say no. But for people who are unaware, on the Bible Geek, uh, uh, listeners often request that uh, Bob does a voice for them and and bob very entertainingly does all sorts of things from irish to um to you know charlton heston to you know all sorts of things but i was wondering if you could do um a new zealand or australian accent for me uh what should i talk about or say <clears throat> uh just uh, Lead, lead, lead Cam to Christ in a New Zealand accent. <laughs> no, don't do that. Uh, I'd like to explain uh, how Jesus did exist, but he was actually a kangaroo. Uh, and uh, he, he wasn't exactly crucified. He was another one on the barbie. <laughs> Once at the Jesus seminar, uh, there was a contingent who had somehow come all the way to California from Australia. And so when I got up there to honor them, I did a parody of a commercial for uh, 
oh, uh, some beer or something. Uh, so and say it's Australian for beer. And uh, the, well, I guess it's travel one. Uh, uh, Australia, it's not like other places. When they say uh, uh, good day, they mean get the F out of here. Uh, and uh, when they say uh, put another one on the barbie, they're talking about your privates. Uh, Australia settled by convicts. And uh, I didn't get lynched somehow. Uh, Maybe they didn't. Maybe the accent was so bad they couldn't even tell I was ridiculing it. Well, Bobby, you're a very affable, likable guy. Um, I thank you so much for coming on. Don't leave just yet. I'm just going to end the live stream now. I want to thank everybody who came out. We had, um, uh, I think, uh, over 70 at one point watching at one time. That means there's probably uh, double that uh, who've come and gone. And so... Um, thank you for the questions. Thank you for listening. Even if you're a Christian who disagreed with everything, I still thank you so much for being here and listening. Um, and uh, we'll see you next time. Take care.